Hello again. Today we're going to talk about Chapter 12 in The Power of Critical Thinking by Louis Vaughn. Um, and Chapter 12 is concerned with critical thinking and morality. Um, and this is a bit of a rework um, over the last edition. Um, it's expanded a little bit, put some things back from the previous, previous edition. Um, edition. And um, we're going to look at a lot of stuff, as per usual. So. Moral arguments, moral statements, um, is moral reasoning even possible? Um, what's the difference between a moral and a non-moral statement? Um, this one here, can't we all just get along, is going to be very crucial for your work in the exam at the end um, with our story. Um, moral premises, moral theories, considered moral judgments, counterexamples. That's interesting. Um, some things that are going on right now politically could benefit from some counterexamples. Um, evaluating moral theories, the moral criteria of advocacy, excuse me, um, critiquing moral theories, um, relativism is in there, two important theories, traditional utilitarianism and Kantian ethics, um, with a little bit about moral dilemmas, and then lastly but not least, our coherent world worldview. My goodness, heat stuff, gotta be back. Okay. So this is your definition for your big word for this chapter, which is morality. Morality concerns beliefs about right and wrong, good and bad, and just and unjust. And that's on page 456. Um, review. Um, a worldview is a philosophy of life, a set of beliefs and theories that helps us make sense of a wide range of issues in life. That's our definition. Um, it also defines for us what exists, what should be, and what we can know. Um, we probably don't have lists of things under those, but we do have lists of things under those, just kind of. Mm. Okay, when we're talking about a moral argument, um, we're talking about an argument that includes two moral statements and a descriptive or non-moral statement. The first one, the premise, is a general principle, okay? Um, it's one of the examples in the books in the book is um, it we should never um, inflict pain on somebody else. Okay, um, spanking inflicts pain on a child. Therefore, we should not spank. Okay, um, so you have a moral statement, the should part, the descriptive, and then the moral statement at the end, the particular phenomenon. So. Let's get busy with this chapter. Get my eraser out of my way. So um, I have four pages of notes to walk through, and I'm going to try to really um, skip through some things, and you can read for yourself. I don't want to read the chapter to you, but there's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, moral arguments, again, are things like this, the should part. Um, a moral statement is a statement asserting that an action is right or wrong, or that something such as a person or motive is good or bad. Um, and then some moral statements. Serena should keep her promise to you. Abortion is immoral. My father is a good man. Those are all things that we're making moral judgments about. But we're also, we can also say those same things in a non-moral way. Serena did not keep her promise to you. Some people think abortion is immoral. My father tried to be a good man. So there's still, you know, some pieces there. So this first little bit here, is moral reasoning even possible? Okay. Some people claim that that's, it's not possible because you can't see it. You can't show it. Um, this view uh, is a moral theory known as emotivism. Emotivism says that moral statements are just not the kinds of things that can be true or false. And you know, remember, that's one of our criteria for a statement is that we can show that it's either true or false. And so these should statements we have a hard time with because we as a society don't have an absolute truth. And this is where we, we have trouble with things like relativism because we don't agree on something that is kind of our end all be all this is what's true all the time okay um, and I sure I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you have said at some time or another well that's my truth 
or that's your truth, it's not my truth, um, that kind of thing. So we have to be careful about how we look at these. Um, our everyday moral experience seems to suggest that we sometimes have moral disagreements with others. Um, and that's just because we're all fallible, right? We all make mistakes. We all get kind of couched into saying or doing things or agreeing with things that aren't perhaps really seriously true. Um, and so we have to be careful. That's always my answer. We have to be careful. Um, moral statements versus non-moral statements. Um, a lot of times what should be, here's my moral statement on that one, what should be um, a moral statement, um, we, we kind of couch it a little bit and we'll say, I'm opposed to abortion or I feel strongly that abortion is wrong. And what we're really saying is, I don't think anybody should think that abortion is right. Um, and there's all kinds of interesting, to put it lightly, um, results from, from those kinds of things. Um, be careful. Sometimes like statements like these are really meant to be moral statements, um, but we're, we're couching it a little bit so that we're not calling you a bad person or saying this is what I believe. Okay. For the record, I'm a pro-choice person. Um, I would love it if we lived in a world where um, abortion was not necessary, but there are lots and lots of reasons for people who have abortions. Um, and we're I'm talking about the, the go and terminate my pregnancy on my own recognizance. I'm not talking about the medically necessary stuff. Um, technically, um, I have had three abortions. Um, I had miscarriages. Um, I've miscarried four times. I've lost five babies. My last set was a set of twin girls at 19 weeks. Um, so I've been through that whole mess. And um, we didn't know I had lupus back then. Probably wouldn't have helped. Um, but anyway, um, those procedures for an ectopic pregnancy for um, what I had was a miscarriage that wasn't complete. Um, those are technically abortions, and they are technically on the table of being banned at the moment. Um, and so it's a hard thing to think about. Um, and it should be a hard thing to think about, but the, the, the harder part of that is not being able to make your own decisions about what is essentially the rest of your life. Um, and I think... I think as a Christian and for my, my you know, other faithful folks, um, it's hard because on the one hand, we know, we know what's right and wrong. On the other hand, we know we live in a fallen world. So there's a lot of things when we think about moral judgments that are very important, not just for what we think in our heads, but what gets played out on a grand scale, you know, countrywide, citywide, whatever. Um, and I think we need to be very, very careful about how much of our own morality we push on somebody else. Um, and like I said, I wish we lived in a, a, a perfect world where every pregnancy was chosen and wanted and excited and looked forward to, but we don't. And so I think we need to be more careful about how we, as a country, how we as people in general, talk about these things and um, legislate these things and be careful that we're doing, as Christians especially, um, I'm gonna probably get in all kinds of trouble for saying this in, in school, but um, as Christians, we our first commandment, the greatest commandment, and Jesus said this himself, is to love and love our neighbors, all of our neighbors, love God, love ourselves. 
and we have to be careful. Um, I think there's a lot of blaming going on right now that doesn't need to, but when people are upset, that's what we tend to do. You should, okay? Think about what yourself, I should, um, and then kind of go from there. So, onward. Um, to that end, on page 459, there's a further thought called, can't we all just get along? And there are fewer moral disagreements than we might think, mainly because most of us would say, yes, this list here is correct. Um, personal benefit, um, acknowledge the extent to which an action produces beneficial consequences for the individual in question, principle of benevolence, help those in need, principle of harm, basically do not harm others. And that's, that's a tenet of every religious persuasion out there, um, except maybe, you know, if you're a Satanist or something like that, but even that, you know, onward. Um, do not harm others. Um, some um, traditions even say, okay, be careful, do not harm others, because anything you put out into the world comes back to you times three. Um, and that's pretty substantial, right? Um, principle of honesty, do not deceive others. Principle of lawfulness, do not violate the law. Principle of autonomy, acknowledge a person's freedom over his or her actions or physical body. Principle of justice, acknowledge a person's right to due process, fair compensation for harm done, and fair distribution of benefits. And then principle of rights. Acknowledge a person's right to life, information, privacy, free expression, and safety. And we have, as thinking, breathing, feeling individuals, we have a duty in some, set, in some respects to abide by these, um, whether it's in our best interest or not. Um, and I think if you are um, a Christian, if you are a devout Muslim, if you are a devout Jewish person, um, whatever, you have in that core of your being, you know that things are right, things are wrong. And even if you practice none of those traditions or no religion at all, um, you know there are certain things that are just wrong to do. And there are certain things that are definitely right to do. And everything else is gray. And you have to figure out, okay, moral dilemma. How do I decide the best course of action moving forward? And so we have some, some things to go with that. So if we're looking at page 461, moral premises. Gauging the truth, this is one of my pieces up here, gauging the truth of moral premises, moral principles, mostly involves examining the support they get from three sources. Other moral principles, moral theories, and are considered moral judgments. Now, moral principles, there are, there's that list. Um, there's also, you know, we shouldn't lie or cheat or steal. Um, I had a friend once who would always give this kind of invocation. Um, and it would be basically, you know, to lying, cheating, and stealing. And everybody's like, what? So if you must lie, lie to save a friend. If you must cheat, cheat death. Um, and if you must steal, steal somebody else's heart. Okay, fall in love, basically. Um, these other moral principles um, go together, and we can kind of shore each other up on that. The moral theories are basically codified groups of moral in, in imperatives that we use to guide our lives. Um, cliche but true, the, the Ten Commandments. Okay, um, They get recycled and used around um, pretty much every other kind of religion. Um, and even if you go back as far back as the first codified laws in Hammurabi, um, Samaria, um, there you are. Um, moral are considered moral judgments. 
these are the moral judgments that we have made or that we consider after we've thought about it and cooled off that we consider credible, okay? Our moral common sense, okay? There are things that are right and wrong, principles of morality um, that we think about and think, okay, this is really how things should go. And thankfully, most of those are already out there, written down places that we can go, okay, I can take this list, I can do that. Um, it'll work. Now, part of the reason, part of the way we can evaluate moral premises is by seeing if they conflict with principles, theories, or judgments that we have good reason to trust, okay? Specifically, we can assess a moral premise the same way we might assess any other kind of universal generalization by trying to think of a counterexample, okay? So if we think about this argument number five they have at the bottom of 462, the medical cloning of humans is unnatural because it is something that would not occur without human intervention. All actions that are unnatural and that are not done for religious reasons should not be done. The medical cloning of humans is never done for religious reasons, therefore cloning humans should not be done. Okay. Now, premise two is the one that's going to get us, right? All actions that are unnatural and that are not done for religious reasons should not be done. That's our moral statement general principle. Okay, so can we think of ways that this might be false? Okay, perfect example here is antibiotics. Okay, if we have all actions that are unnatural and they're not done for religious reasons should not be done. Antibiotics are actions that are unnatural, okay? We wouldn't have them unless humans made them, but we don't use them for religious rituals or religious rites. So, the use of antibiotics seems to be morally acceptable to almost everyone. Almost everyone. There are exceptions. So, premise two appears to be false. So, we have to go back and try again, okay? What else can we say against human cloning that would make it you know, be false. So that's how that goes. Theories of morality are attempts to explain what makes an action right or makes a person or motive good. They try to specify what all right actions and all good things have in common. As, su as such, they can give support, guidance, or validation to our moral decision making, shaping our moral principles, judgments, and arguments. We all have a moral theory. Just like we all have a worldview, even if we don't articulate it, we still use it, okay? We use it often unconsciously, and it's until we go back and look at ourselves and look at our decisions and go, oh, I should have done X, Y, and Z, okay? Um, when we're going to evaluate a moral theory, we have to compare competing theories and use the criteria of adequacy to appraise their worth. So a lot of our moral theories are like scientific theories, right? We have this idea, we have this hypothesis, and we think that this particular action is right. And so we have to think about, okay, well, what makes an action right? And that's where the moral theories come in, okay? Um, the two that we're going to look at is traditional utilitarianism and Kantian ethics, mainly because they look at two different ways of getting at morality. Um, traditional utilitarianism, in a nutshell, is right actions are those that achieve the greatest happiness for the greatest number. The consequences are what matter. Okay? And this is one of the kind of background noise kind of morality features that walks around with us all the time. And you hear this all the time, right? Your point in life is to be happy, the pursuit of happiness, um, all of that kind of stuff. Don't worry, be happy. And 
we have this kind of, like I said, running around in the back of our minds all the time because it's so prevalent in our culture. Um, and you can imagine, this is interesting, okay? Right actions are those that achieve the greatest happiness for the greatest number. Please, please, please read the, the, the examples and stuff in the book because it'll help you figure this out and see how pervasive it is. Um, the other one that we're looking at is by Immanuel Kant, um, Kantian Ethics, and you probably won't hear that particular terminology outside of a philosophy course, but it's out there all around. Um, morality is about conforming your actions to universal moral rules derived from reason and doing so for duty's sake alone. Okay, this is the dispassionate um, follow the rules kind of thing. Now, the maxim here, this is an interesting way of looking at this, um, and Dr. Vaughn does an excellent job of kind of parsing things out and showing you things, but Kant believes, believed that you should never do an action unless it would be a good idea for everybody to do that action all the time. Okay, so if, well, the one in the book is um, if you're going to, you need to borrow some money. You have no intention of paying it back. You have no way to pay it back. And so you go to your friend and you make a promise and they give you the money and you go about your merry way. Um, made you happy. Probably didn't make your friend happy. Probably don't have that friend anymore. But your action is personally advantageous but if everybody did that, then there would not be, we would not understand, we would never know the idea of keeping a promise. And so that's, that's a horrible place to live. Um, the other one is a plausible moral theory has to be consistent with the relevant background information. Okay. And when we're looking at Kantian ethics, the first formulation, he says, act only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. Okay, that's a little complex sentence there. Um, so the maxim, here's my thing, I don't have to, I don't have to follow my promises. I don't have to act on my promises. I have to keep my promises. Okay, what happens if nobody keeps their promises, ever, for anything, imagine the mess our life would be in, okay? Um, now, we know in our current life, in our current world, lots of people break their promises, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for not good reasons, and, you know. Um, our consider moral judgment seems to suggest that in general saving an innocent life has far more value than blindly adhering to the absolute rule. So when we're up against follow the rules or save a life, most of us, most of us, um, would fall in the save a life, okay? Um, and that gets us into this idea of a moral dilemma. Okay. Um, situations in which moral duties or principles are in conflict. Okay. If I'm following Kantian ethics, some duties are absolutist. Okay. Really, all of them are absolutist. You have to conform to these universal moral rules because you're doing it for duty sake alone, which means you're never going to not do them. Okay. Well, what happens if they're in conflict? Okay, I'm supposed to value life um, and hold life as sacred. Okay. Well, I'm also never supposed to lie and never supposed to steal. What if my family's survival, literal survival, requires me to steal food? I'm, I'm frozen. I'm stuck. I can't ever 
do anything about it, right? Um, now, other theories like utilitarianism and a few others are a little more flexible, okay? They're not absolutist. They have what is called prima facie principles, um, which means the rules apply unless exceptions are warranted. And exceptions are warranted when two principles conflict. Okay, you have to decide which principle holds the most weight. Okay, life above lies, for instance. And even though there is no hard and fast rule for making this work, we have guidance, right? It's, it's the same thing as in our COA for everything else, right? Is look at what you have here and do your best. Um, the moral criteria of adequacy, page 467. Um, if we're evaluating a moral code or a moral statement, moral argument, has to be consistent with our considered moral judgments, things that we already know are true, okay? Consistency with our experience of a moral life. Now we know we live a moral life, however you wanna go around that. Um, our morality is built on compromise, whether you wanna think that way or not. Um, and so when we think about how we go about the moral life, um, we make moral decisions, we disagree about morality with other folks, um, and sometimes we act immorally. These are all part of the moral life. Um, when we act immorally, a lot of times we have to go back and apologize and make restitution and reconciliation, and then we go on and we try to do better. And the last one is workability in real world situations. Okay. And this is, this is my hardest one. I think we should love first and worry about the rest later. Um, and I practice this in my own life, and sometimes it gets me in deep caca. Um, but on the other hand, I can see where in a perfect world, and that's my, my, my qualification, right? In a perfect world, yes, we should follow X and Y and Z. We don't live in a perfect world. And we should still try our best to follow X, Y, and Z, um, but we have to give some grace when people don't, and lots of people don't, because we live in a fallen world. We are not good people. We are not perfect. Our hearts are definitely not perfect. And so we have to think about what that means when we make decisions, especially if we're in a position of power to make decisions for other people. And that brings us to our last piece, a coherent worldview. Now, the whole book has been working towards this, right? We started with worldview back in chapter two, and a little bit in chapter one, but mostly in chapter two. So the idea here is that a coherent worldview is a massive intellectual construct with many elements. It's not easy. It's not immediately apparent, even if we want it to be. Um, the work of building plausible worldviews will always involve eliminating inconsistencies. We have in our heads a worldview that helps us get through our daily lives, makes our decisions easier, um, or more consistent at least. But then there are things that we have in our head that we believe are true but they don't get acted out exactly correctly, okay? And so that's the inconsistency, right? We don't realize a lot of times that we have conflicting ideas in our worldview until one of those scenarios comes up and we have to go, oh, well, how do I do that, okay? Um, and the very last line in the actual text of, te of, the, of the chapter, our worldviews are far too important not to subject subject them to intelligent reasoned reflection. So in the end, our beginning, Socrates was right. The unexamined life is not worth living. And if we don't examine and rework and revise um,
how we think and what we think, um, then we're stuck, right? We can't ever get out of the status quo. And if you don't realize this already, we really need to think differently so we can get out of this status quo. Um, we need to really, in our hearts, believe in equality. Um, we need to really, in our hearts, believe that every other person on the planet is just as worthy as we are, if not more so. Um, and we also need to know that when we act in the world, it has ripples. Um, what we say and do today makes a difference 10, 15 years down the road, at least for us, um, and maybe for lots of other folks, depending upon what decisions we're making, right? So I know this is a lot of kind of heavy stuff. It's here at the end. Um, but if this kind of stuff interests you, you might also want to take the ethics class that we offer. It's kind of cool. So anyway, chapter 12 is all about morality and a coherent worldview, and they're hard. They're a lot of work. Um, and we can't always do our best that way. Um, but more often than not, um, we need to think about what we do before we do it. We need to think about what we say before we say it. And we need to show compassion to those that we disagree with, um, especially those that we disagree with. So let me know if you have questions on this chapter or anything else, and I'm happy to help. Um, you know how to get a hold of me. You have my email.